Okay, well, we're just going to continue this afternoon's theme. It's really all about uh, measurements and KPIs and all those wonderful things and driving outcomes in particular. So I'm not going to introduce the panellists. They're going to introduce themselves. We'll go down the line, starting with Martin in a second, and everybody just have one minute just to introduce yourselves and your company and also just tell us about some kind of measurement innovation that excites you right now. So Martin, off you go. Uh, yes, hi, Martin Bentley from Audience Projects. We're a research technology company. We mainly work with brands to help them understand and optimise cross-media audience reach frequency and uh, audience <laughs> consistency. Uh, measurement innovation, oh, I don't know. It's difficult not to sort of talk about my, ourselves here. Oh, no. oh. Um, well, we've recently invented, well, not invented, but created a kind of tool to have, try and work out what the potential ROI of audience measurement could be for, for customers of ours. So um, that's kind of looking back at lots of campaign data and we can use that to understand what the optimization potential is if you measure audiences, understand and then uh, do something or act on that data. So their reason to use you, the ROI? It's a bit of a sales tool, yes, but yeah. it might be productized at some point as well. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. And Daniel? Yeah, so Dan Orchiman, uh, Global Head of Marketing and Business Development at Ipsos. Um, so we are a full-service uh, research agency. Um, in terms of the uh, most innovative, there's so many things to talk about. I think I'm going to go with something quite faddy, which is uh, machine learning, which is not one thing, I know, I realise that. Um, but I think it's really um, accelerating the way that we can do things right now. Um, there's lots of different attributes to machine learning, helping build out kind of synthetic populations. Um, you know, the whole rise right now in terms of generative and predictive. I could go on and on about it, but yeah, I think that's the one thing that's really interesting to me right now because I think it's going to change things um, for the good. But there are also risks and, and pitfalls. Yes, of course. Okay, and Laura? Uh, so I'm Laura Cal, Chief Data and Product Officer at Havas Media. My mic's definitely too close to me. <laughs> Didn't dress well for the, for the audio. Um, so I've been in media agencies for about 16 years now. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult now to still get excited by, or distracted, shall we say, by the new kind of innovation and measurement. But what I do see the opportunity is uh, new innovation and measurement. It gives you another tool for the toolbox, right? I think we need to be pulling in as many different data sets as possible into the toolkit that we have to help make uh, uh, smarter planning decisions. Okay, and Gordon? Uh, and I'm Gordon Black, Director of uh, Media Measurement and Learning um, at Adidas. Um, my role is kind of responsible for making sure we learn from every euro we invest to make sure we have the confidence to keep investing and try and do really cool stuff. Um, in terms of innovation that excites me, I'll, I'll go with um, uh, the rise of causal impact modelling as a kind of test and learn approach to, to measuring. I just like it because it's, it's got people talking about cause and effect and forcing the language around incrementality, moving people away from talking about tracked ROAS, which, which means nothing um, or everything to, to everyone. If we're actually truly talking causal impact, it does mean we're actually talking about incrementality. Yeah. I mean, I loved your, I loved your cake um, analogy earlier. You go back and find out all the ingredients. And, uh... <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, earlier I, I was explaining kind of MMM, and uh, my, my favourite analogy of it is you know, it's, it's unbaking a cake. It, you, you want, you've got this delicious cake in front of you, and you want to recreate it. Um, so you just get to be a, a, an experimental chef and, and try all the ingredients, and eventually you'll get there. Uh, you'll know that right mix of, of flour and sugar, and, and once you know how to make that cake, you can make a better cake quite easily by by tweaking all those things. So. Yeah. yeah. So, Gordon, based on what you've learned from MMM in the last few years at Adidas, I mean, how have you optimised your use of media? Yeah, it, it, there's really boring answers to that. It's like, well, we've, we've maximised our return by, by optimising, balancing through uh, the full funnel kind of approach. Um, so, won't go into that because there's not much to say, but we do that. You know, every plan um, goes through a lens of, of optimising for unified long-term goals. And then within that, you're able to plan each part to actually execute, you know, be that upper funnel plan to drive the appropriate brand KPI generally consideration, uh, moving through the funnel to, um, to look at kind of credibility before we then start in against the, the harder end of, of short term metrics. But it's, it's using all of them together to, to, um, to make those decisions. But in terms of then like some exciting stuff, you wanted an exciting answer on that. It's, it's, we do that to bread and butter to prove effectiveness, prove return on investment, maximise it. 
we then are able to do exciting things like we, we partnered with, with Super Awesome on uh, creating worlds in Fortnite uh, that are brands there. Of course on its own, like that's not going to wash its face of everyone that plays in our virtual world is going to race out and buy a pair of trainers. Of course that's not going to happen. But it gave us confidence to try something like that and then be able to, to set up kind of how we assess the performance of that, which is not just about people playing in those environments, it's about people uh, creating videos about those environments, talking to their friends about those environments, coming up with a way of measuring the really cool stuff um, to make sure that kind of there's always room to do it and have confidence to do it. Okay, and in terms of your KPIs when you launch a campaign, what are the kind of the big KPIs that, KPIs that you're looking for? And then what are the media KPIs that help you to move towards them? Yeah, I mentioned on the, the big KPIs uh, is, you know, the, the critical point to start that though is define success, the brief better state, what this activity is there to drive. Is it to drive consideration? Then assess it against driving consideration. Is it credibility? Assess it against that. Um, so we define that and we will always have hard KPIs on, on our brief to make sure that's kind of how you set it up. Then, in terms of media delivery, for me it's, it's not that there's a strict rule of, of absolute consistency on, on a unified measurement, but everything must have something that is fit for purpose for uh, the holistic measurement that we'll ultimately do. So uh, be that with TV, you'll measure it in GRPs, TVRs. Um, ideally with, with display, you will have um, impressions, viewable impressions. Uh, ideally you move to something that's more representative of attention, as I know we'll, we'll talk about very soon. Um, it's not that there's kind of a one size fits all, but it's about reviewing each part of your plan. Just in the same way as you've defined success, you make sure you've defined what that channel is assessed against as well. Okay, and then Martin, you gave us 30 seconds on audience projects. Spend a little bit more time now. Tell us exactly what you do in terms of the measurement contribution you make to this market. Yes. Um, what, what, yeah, so we, we work with brands predominantly to help them understand the cross-media reach and frequency of what they're deploying. Um, we, we do the kind of digital measurement piece, and then the, we will fuse with the local TAM, uh, so in the UK, BARB data, internally or externally, on, on equivalent equi impressions. So the kind of contribution, we think, is, is in some ways about really going back to basics, because there's so many different things, or KPIs or measurement things for the brands to look at. It's very difficult to know where to start. But, um, you know, I started out in TV, really, after a short stint in um, selling ads in magazines. But the, the, the primary objective is to sell products. You've got to tell all the people who could potentially buy your product about the product. So the, the old-fashioned OnePlus cover is, is still really important to achieve the maximum possible reach to the relevant audience. So that's where we can, we can start out with the measurement across the TV and the digital piece. And then, and then go from there in terms of a journey where you can then sort of perhaps optimise, start looking at effectiveness as well on top of the reach, because it's no good just having reach if it's not effective. So we, we work in, in that way as well. Okay, and it's incremental reach, presumably, the, is that the most important thing you show people right now across platform? Or? Yeah, I think, I think incremental reach of the right target audience, not just reach for reach's sake. So, it's, you know, what is the target audience? How are you reaching at? What could potentially be improved? Because these are fundamentals to ensure that you're getting bang for buck and, and also letting the consumers know that there's a, there's a product there for them. And you mentioned obviously it has to be effective reach. I mean, once you've worked out the incremental reach into target or reach into target, what are you or your clients doing to then prove that that's effective reach? Well, they'll work with us in some cases with, with some um, kind of sales lift type studies that we do, but and also they'll, they'll work with other um, vendors so there's, it's quite regular that our customers will also be using um, uh, attention data and working with attention uh, vendors to look at kind of ACPMs, which was discussed just now. So you start to kind of stack rank the different KPIs to understand what, what should stay in your media mix based on these different KPIs and what should perhaps be optimised out and reinvest that into what's working. Okay. And Laura, what are the media KPIs that most influence your media planning right now? I, yeah, I think like um, to echo a lot of the comments earlier, step back first, of course, we start the plan in terms of looking at what the business goals are, uh, and then what are the brand perceptions that we need to shift to get to those business goals. And I think that, you know, the idea that there's one magic bullet or one magic metric which is going to solve 
all challenges, of course, is, isn't true. Um, so what we've designed is tools that help us, first of all, identify what is the perception we need to shift. And that will be um, you know, where we're behind the competition, focus on a metric where we can influence it with media, because a lot of metrics we can't. Um, and then, of course, as well, a metric that has a proven link through to shifting sales. So once we find that right KPI, um, then we look at the media metrics that best reflect that KPI, all right? Um, and I think that, like, you know, the, 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 this is the approach that we take. I, I do think, you know, we've talked a little bit in some of the earlier panels about perhaps the tension between marketing and the boardroom. But I think, like, that there's also a tension to talk about perhaps in the back room as well, where a lot of, um, you know, we, we know which the right metrics to optimise to are. We understand that our goal should be driving sales, um, but we have to kind of recognise as well that sometimes a contract may restrict us in the sense that we're looking to achieve year on year cost savings, right? So in which case then you've got a tension immediately between what the right thing to do is for maximising a client's business um, and, and then perhaps what, you know, and it, it comes down to is media seen as a cost or an investment, right? And I think that that's... Um, as well as speaking the language of the boardroom, I think we've got to address the, the problem in the back room as well. Um, and there's a kind of an ideal where contracts are led by value, not by price, right? But I think as we're kind of moving toward that ideal, the way that we tackle it is, you know, you, you're always going to compromise something by optimising to anything, right? So if we optimise to maximise attention, it might be more expensive. Um, or a plan that maximises sales might kind of damage long-term brand growth, right? So I think that in the optimization tools that we build, it's always recognizing that you kind of just need to have that balance through the funnel so that you might be kind of looking for the most efficient plan and the most effective at the same time, okay. recognizing you're not uh, maximizing either. You know? So is that tension between what you think would be the ideal KPIs to go for to hit sort of big business outcomes and what you might be told to go for or have to go for for contracts? I mean, is that still a major problem or...? Well, I, thought, I mean, you know, if you look at how a lot of pitch processes are run, there will obviously be an exercise in which agencies are judged based on the cost of the media that they deliver. Um, th there's a perfect world, I think, where media agencies are judged based on the value that they deliver and that the contracts are then built around that value, you know, that, you, that everyone has skin in the game, to use a dreadful phrase, and that we are working to kind of achieve shared goals. Um, I think that, that, that there are quite a few steps to get there, right? And in particular, because, of course, the easiest thing for a media agency to prove is cost, right? As you move further down the funnel, it gets harder and harder to prove the contribution that you've made. Of course, it can be done, but there are a lot of other factors at play as well. I mean, are there still days when you go home and bash your head against the wall because you <laughs> think you've just had to do something that isn't in the long-term best interest of a brand? Or... Right, well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes, perhaps, if, if you've asked, because uh, I'm really proud of the work that our team does in terms of the econometric models, and, but then you, you do sometimes look at the recommendations and the reality of, 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 of the plan and the restrictions that might be placed on, on a plan, be it, you know, of course, if you want to, some of the channels that drive sales might not be as good at driving reach. There's always this. And I think that it's, it's less of a restriction, it's more of a compromise through the funnel, right? Um, because we don't want to be just delivering incredibly expensive. It's always compromised through the funnel. Okay. Can I just add something to that? Mm, way? And I think you know, part of the challenge in the industry right now is really that we focus a lot on delivery. Um, and so you know, a lot of what you talked about there and you know, Gorn, you talked mm. about earlier about um, MMM, I think is really, really interesting, but it's that trade-off between kind of the delivery metrics that we can use for reach yeah. versus really the impact metrics at mm. the same time. And I think there is a... Um, um, a challenge in that way that sometimes we kind of bring or try and bring them all together uh, mm. and, and I think it's right when you say it's like a cake or it's a frame at Ipsos we say it's more like a framework in that sense mm. when you've got different kind of specialisms to achieve different things so be it mm. audience understanding or brand health tracking or, mm. or creative you know uh, improving your creative in that way and I think we as an industry need to think more about kind of the impact metrics that we can actually measure mm. and distinguish from kind of delivery metrics. Okay, well, I mean, you help to deliver the impact metrics, don't you? So Ipsos, I mean, we'll talk about your measurement part of your business in a minute, but one of the big things you do is polls and surveys, mm -hmm. etc. So tell us what you can tell a brand. I mean, it's the, the big brand level metrics. Well, 
I think it's more than, I think you do Ipsos a disservice by saying polls and surveys. I think we've got um, <laughs> some good technology and <laughs> good approaches there at the same time. Um, you know, I, I think um, what we really try and help our clients do is understand people. Um, and I think that's what we really need to kind of go back to um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a measurement purpose, is really understanding the context of how we're reaching people, what are they doing. You know, yeah. So in today's world with digital, when you think of mobile phones, TV, you know, digital billboards, for instance, there is almost, I hesitate to say a laziness, but there is almost an approach to take your YouTube ad and put it outside and outdoor because you can, right? Um, and I think that's not right, because when you think about people, it's people that make decisions, it's people that choose to buy a brand. And someone's mindset changes depending on the device that they're using, the medium that they're actually um, consuming, but also actually kind of the content that it's next to. Because I think from an advertising standpoint, apart from maybe out of home, actually advertising is a disruption. Because you're typically going to whatever channel you're going to, mm actually to consume that, you know, be it news, be it sport. Yeah. And so that's why I say what we try to do at Ipsos is obviously leverage the different kind of tools that we have to understand that context. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're trying to do copy testing, for instance, building a framework where actually you're not just testing the creative messaging, you're putting it in the context at the same time where someone might be watching that. Um, okay. Well, tell us about the media measurement side mm -hmm. of things as well for Ipsos then. Yes, yeah, so we've got um, lots of different kind of uh, solutions there. You know, we have um, social listening tools such as Synthesio. Um, you know, I think one of the areas that we've been foraying uh, much more into is kind of the area of passive measurement. Mm -hmm. um, so really trying to understand in more or less real time what is actually happening and what are people actually doing. Um, so one of the approaches that we do is we've got actually, um, you know, one of the things, you talked about polls, we've got lots of panellists. Um, so uh, it enables us essentially with those panellists to install an, an app um, and it allows us to actually recognise what types of content they're consuming. So um, we do that um, with MediaCell. It's an ACR technology, so audio content recognition. Um, and essentially what we do is we either um, match back to the content or we do audio encoding, which is a sonic sound, to understand has that ad been seen. So I, the advantage for us, because it's passive, is it sits in the background, so people tend to forget. So you actually get a more realistic um, response and a more re realistic um, understanding of what's going on. Um, but what's also interesting is actually you start going beyond kind of just the device and channel. So, you know, in TV, typically it's in home. What, what passive measurement can do is start to measure out of home consumption of TV at the same time, be it a pub, be it whatever. Okay. And so it's independent panel based mm -hmm. and you can also show cross media measurement? Yep. So um, because it's audio, um, it's audio and digital. So we can, we can do that across um, radio, TV um, um, and desktop. Like I said, um, the content itself, as long as it's got sound, it allows us to measure kind of cross media um, content in that way. Okay, and Gordon, we've talked a lot about attention already in this session. Now, I mean, increasingly we can measure it in a scientific fashion, certainly for passive attention. I mean, do you look at attention as a valuable new KPI? Uh, absolutely. Um, attention, I'm, I'm very much on the bandwagon. It's, um, for me, I've always been of the, the principle, not all reach is equal, mm -hmm. and attention is the latest real quality metric to, to try and put to quantify that not all reach being equal. Um, however, it's it, it's just kind of one of, of many things you need to consider. And, and it's just listening to you, Laura, um, the frustrations of chasing the, the cheap impressions and everything, it's, it, it's the importance of when you're assessing your media buys, it needs to not just be on cost, but also on quality. And attention plays a very valuable emerging role of, of being able to assess the quality uh, of the media that we're buying. Okay, so it's an important KPI. Do you think it could ever be a currency? Because I've actually heard people saying that. Yeah, I'd, I would love it to be a currency, but you know, when it, it's taken this long, we've not got a common currency of, of reach. Um, we're not going to have a common currency of attention anytime soon. That's not to say give up on it, but um, it, realistically, it's, there's not going to be a common currency of attention mm. soon. That's, that's not to say don't chase it. Um, and individually, it's an advantage that you, that you can have. If you've got something that's convinced you that that is an accurate reflection of, of the attention you're able to buy, make the most of that opportunity while, while you have it. Um, if it is truly representative, it will be the winner and it will become the common currency, hopefully, you know, this idealistic world. 
Um, but I, I don't think we're close to, to um, attention being a, an absolute common currency. Okay. And Laura, I think Gordon, sorry, sorry, if I can interrupt again, I think Gordon's right um, when we think about um, TV and digital. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say out of home because out of home would probably argue that actually they've got some sort of solution you know, with the VAC model in that sense. Mm. So vis visibility adjusted contacts is a trading currency now of attention. Mm. So whilst attention is new maybe to TV and new to, to digital, it's less so maybe in the out of home space, albeit I will also say now everyone's looking at their phones so mm. it also needs to evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Laura, I mean, do you, presumably you like attention because it's in your control, I would guess, as a media agency. You can go out and buy <coughs> attention. Yeah, I mean, so we think so. Have us have um, really proud to sign, signed a, a contract with Lumen globally because there's access to a huge amount of data, which which I'm very excited about. And again, it's it's another thing where we take this data and we build it into our planner, planning tools, and it gives us another dimension, right, in terms of how we're looking at how we optimise the media mix. It is it is right though that there are still still gaps. I mean, Lumen's doing great work to fill those gaps, but we use panels, for example, in order to try and. Um, to fill gaps in the attention data that we have. But where we do have it, it's incredibly rich. So we've built out uh, a few tools. So we've built a tool called the Meaningful Media Planner, one me Meaningful Social Matrix. And in every case as well, as well as kind of digging into the kind of the formats, devices that will deliver most attention, it's always as well then going, oh, how does that balance against cost? How does that balance against performance metrics? So that we can then build a plan that optimizes uh, either to a specific KPI, if, if, that's, if that's the brief, or that we, we, we're always looking to make sure that we're balancing through the funnel as well. So you, are you already yeah. optimising to attention plus Yeah, very reach. much so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we supported um, Sam from James with the project right. for Lumen, yeah. Of course you did, yeah. Mm. So your colleague here, yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, would anyone ever come to you and say, we want a campaign based on ma the maximum passive attention you can give us in the next three months? I mean, is that just... Is that ridiculous or is that a possibility? It, has, I, I, it, it hasn't got so popular that it's coming through in the KPIs and the brief yet. Yeah, I, I do say that, but <laughs> I, I, I could see that coming. You know, I mean, it yeah. will still tend to be, of course, when we get the brief, it's a, it's a reach and frequency target, but by having the right tools in place, you can start to dig into that into the target and, and start to look at what that would mean in terms of attention and what that would mean in terms of, of other KPIs. It, I've never seen it written yet, though, but <laughs> I, I can imagine it happening soon. Okay, and Martin, when we talked about attention once, you said that it's, it will probably be quite stable between the different media channels and maybe in formats. I mean, is, is this attention wave just going to be a big benchmarking exercise? So we work out which, which sort of channels work well, like we saw with Simon at uh, Dreams just now. We work out which formats work, and then we can just kind of just go back to how we lived before, and we'll just build that into the, the, the planning. Yeah, if you asked me on a Friday afternoon, I'd probably agree with that because you know you want to you want to keep things simple. I think to get started, mm. and, the, and the real problem is, I think, for the marketers, having spent a day with with a big marketer and all, and a lot of the marketers ven, ven, vendors last week, and he's standing over there. He, Peter at Boots organised a really good day. It, it was apparent to me how much the the marketer has to think about and how many companies are all going. Hey, we've got this amazing kind of measurement data. It's going to change your world. And 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 where do you start? You know, mm. it's like. You've got to find something, a fairly simple KPI or um, idea that you want to prove. Mm. Like if I make sure that people see my ads and, in, and the right amount of people see them, and you can optimise even by 10%, you're, you're going to be way ahead of where you were before you did it. But I think the danger with, with it's not really only on attention, but any of this stuff, is if you try and get everything perfect at the start of your journey, you're just never going to start the journey. So I, what we've seen certainly with, with the brands that we've worked with, and I touched on this before, some reach measurement by say four or five channels and attention grade each channel, and you, mm. you've suddenly drawn some very, very good first conclusions that mm. you, can, you can perhaps then optimise things in and out and go to the next part of the journey. Because, and I think Laura made this point when we were, when we were prepping for this, that attention for like say tv is is fairly well known for linear tv it's a strong it's a strong grade but it's going to be slightly different between audiences mm. and so as you go on an optimization journey you then need to start looking at all these different things in more detail to keep um, getting those incremental grain and gains as well the impact of creative as well in terms of yeah, like, yeah. And that, that's one of the exercises we want to do with our with our uh, databases to go 
you know, which part is an impact of the media and the format and which part is an impact of the creative as well. Yeah. And the audiences, you know, so there's a lot of factors to take We into. never talk about creative on these panels. This is what, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it is still, I think, I remember yeah. the old Nielsen chart from ages mm. ago, creative has the biggest impact on any ad campaign before. Mm -mm. There's no one talking about creative here. So, um, mm. we'll just talk about other measurement aspects. I do think, like, um, to the point, when you're talking earlier about, you know, if we shift from a channel focus to an audience focus, then it's just about aligning the right piece of content with the right message to the right to the right person at the right price. Um, you know that that's where we should be going for because then all of a sudden these questions about optimizing to a single KPI just disappear. We're optimizing to audiences, and and then we're looking to kind of shift the shift the perceptions of those audience groups. Right? Yeah. It becomes a. a just turns the channel, yeah. challenge around. And to dovetail on both those points, actually, you know, um, you asked the question about metrics and trying to get to 100% attention. I think it's more important about what do you want to do with that attention at the mm. same time, because, you know, if your message isn't right at the right time, it doesn't really matter. And, and you know, probably people in this audience are looking at me right now, but they've probably switched off thinking about other things, right? So there, there are other elements. Don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> 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 other elements to think about. <laughs> Two people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> No. What about uh, context then, Daniel? Because I know you, you think that's the one thing that we might have to track on a very regular basis in terms of attention, the actual environment the ad is in, and the, well, the content, basically. Good mm. content means more. Correct. Uh, even a rubbish football match could yeah. get less attention than a good one? Or? Correct, completely, because it depends on your mindset, depends on what you're, you're thinking, you know? I'm mm. a Spurs fan right now, and... <laughs> <laughs> yes, right you're the same okay. way on that one. But I, I also agree, um, you know, with what Martin saying is that we do need to kind of start somewhere. Um, mm. You know, there, there is a, a purest element of trying to have a, a perfect system, and we do need to try and, mm. and, and focus on that. But beyond that, I think, um, and the reason why I said about 100% attention, if you think of um, McDonald's, you know, McDonald's have done a great out-of-home campaign recently where they actually sliced up their logo, which is directions that you've gone past or not gone past, you know, mm. where it is. You don't need a lot of attention for that in that mm. way. So the context of it is really key in terms of mm -hmm. what is the message you're trying to convey, and then the context is also important in terms of the channel and what it's next to yeah. at the same time. Because the context will also help to garner attention. You know, so mm. a breaking news piece versus you know, a long-form investigative article is going to have different yeah. rationale. So that's why I say we have to remember that we're disturbing audiences, and so mm. what we need to do with our creative is build things that add to that experience. Okay. And Gordon, just coming back to sort of effectiveness at the high sort of KPN, KPI end of things, um, you mentioned a term lift per thousand when we spoke last week. I mean, you know, is that just a, a nice concept that kind of encapsulates what you want or is that a KPI? What is that? Yeah, yeah. For me, like, ideally everything would be outcome-based KPIs. And so and when I mentioned lift per thousand, it's when we were talking about kind of attention and effective reach, it was just kind of saying, well, you're measuring what you're actually trying to achieve, which if it is a consideration lift, you know, let's, let's assess it on how much we paid for that consideration lift, not any other hygiene metric that came in between to, to deliver that. It's, I, I absolutely kind of would want us to always make sure we're evaluating on uh, outcome and, and is, is it worthwhile rather than anything that comes in between. Okay. Um, right, and also, Gordon, just before I open up to the, the audience, so I'll do audience questions in a second. Um, are there any media metrics other than attention, maybe, that you look at and think, oh, that's a potential currency? Anything new coming through? Uh, as a potential currency, because I know we talked before, you know, converting it all to um, effective reach or an incremental reach, you know, effective reach, the, the idea of if you're able to prove what you're buying is, is against the right audience and they're active and you are engaged them enough to respond, great as a concept, but not a common currency. Um, incremental reach, it's like, of course we want to reach that hard to reach audience and it's worth paying to get to them, but it doesn't represent how the consumer responds. You know, it's like not, this is when we talk about just planning against an audience, agree in principle, but making sure you've reached everyone once is, is not what's going to drive the outcomes. It's, it's having built that effective reach, which might be seeing the ad in three different places, just in the right order that worked for you. Uh, so not a useful answer of, of, is there a metric, but it's kind of, it's, it's exploring everything else that might come. And then once again, I'll push it back to, well, try and measure an outcome. And then it's, mm. it's understand the outcome. And then retrospectively, you can look at the balance of the cost you were paying for that media, the quality of that media, be that through attention, be that through premium state, and then, and, um, and, and you merge that together to then judge was it a worthwhile outcome? Okay, well actually I'll ask that question to you, Martin, because one of the sort of 
things that are coming out of the US and all these alternative measurement and currency solutions is incremental reach and people actually trading on incremental reach rather than just reach. I mean, you're in that game. Do you see that as a potential currency? Well, so we don't, we don't sell media, we're measuring, but we've, we've known of some companies that have done some, in, have sort of sold media based on increment, how much incremental reach they can deliver. And I think they've largely stopped doing it because it's quite risky because, you know, the, 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 the seasons change, the ground shifts, and you, you have to take a very high risk position to kind of continually buy on behalf of your client until you hit this magic number, which could quite easily be debated. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, certainly I did spend some time selling media in various channels. I probably wouldn't want to trade on that because you have to take mm -hmm. all the risk. Um, but you might also win some quite nice business, but it'd be a gamble. Um, okay. Right, do we have any audience questions at this point? Okay, gentlemen just behind Omar there. Cheers. Hello. Uh, Simon Redican from Pamco. Um, Pretty much every major econometric survey I've ever seen says that the lowest return comes from online display. Conversely, the fastest growing sector over the last 10 years at least has been online display. So what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Firstly, it's, it's not every econometric show that I've seen. We, we see display perform quite strongly uh, in our hierarchy. Mm. Um, I'd say it's been guilty of, well, th th to be clear, fastest growing, there has been a lot of crap display. You know, it, it started as, as being terrible activity. When we talked earlier about the importance of your advertising is, is requesting a consumer's attention, be that passive or, or in reality, a lot of the display was very disruptive, unwanted, so it, it probably wasn't having a, a positive effect. Um, it, it, to kind of really align with, with that thinking, but also to, to rest assured it's kind of if measured appropriately, if doing good activity, it should be measured, it should be strong within your hierarchy. Mm. Um, and if it's not strong within your hierarchy, maybe it's because you've pushed it into diminishing returns, you've, you've started doing too much. I think we, we, we committed so much money to it that we were doing it at, at quite a high level. So yeah, challenge you, it can definitely work, but it needs to be balanced. Does anyone want to add anything? Well, I would yeah. just... Oh, sorry. Do you want to... Oh, well, I would just say a kind of slightly silly comment, but I mean, I think that if you looked at the trade marketing budgets of the different channels over the last 10 or 15 years, online display had the biggest trade marketing budgets. They had all the yachts at can. A lot of money was changing hands because it was fun to invest in online display and it was over-invested in, I think. Okay, Laura. I, I, mean, I think that... Um... It would be wonderful if everyone read all the econometric modelling uh, <laughs> results that we produced and, and took that as the gospel in terms of how they ought to spend. That doesn't happen as a first thing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it did, but it, but also as well, you know, again, it comes back to that idea of balance. The you know, the, it's not the only metric that you'll be planning to as well because there's a huge amount of inventory online. People have purchased it. You know, it, it depends the objective that someone set. Right? There's a question earlier about reaching younger audiences. You know, depending on which metric you look at, it can push budget in a particular direction, which as you, you say, and I agree, isn't necessarily the right one, you know. But that's why you just got to have the balance of metrics and could have been diminishing returns, it could have been poor quality inventory, but you just have to have the right dimensions against which you're optimising. Um, and that doesn't always happen, right? Yeah. Okay, have we got any more audience questions? Okay, well in that, oh there's one down the end, sorry. Okay, just wait for the mic and tell us who you are as well. Um, hi, it's Finish from Vodafone. Um, question I've got is around if you've got any measurement tips on uh, how you would incorporate um, sponsorship of properties and so not mm. media sponsorships, but pro sponsorships of events and those sorts of things into MMM mm -hmm. so that it can evaluate those against, um, you know, other comes including brand activity mm -hmm. which would you know still it does that job of driving consideration rather than being mm -hmm. sort of more bottom of the funnel but if you've got any um mm. insight that would be hugely helpful thank okay. you okay do you want anyone in particular to answer that do you want to uh, choose anybody? no open up to the panel whoever wants to answer right. who wants to take it uh, I think everyone's looking at me for that one. <laughs> okay. um, I, I think, you know, it, it's difficult in that sense to, to, to measure. Mm. I, um, what's interesting is, you know, I started saying about machine learning and how machine learning is going to be really interesting. Um, with um, computer vision software now, 
I think in the future you will see that that could start to help to answer mm. that kind of question. Um, because the, the, the ability to, to um, capture all that, Im, uh, the information that you're getting from images, yeah. um, to tag that data at speed, to enable that data, and then to understand, you know, how many audiences were there and so forth. I think um, I think that's one way to do it. I don't think there's a, a, a good approach yet, but. Um, that's simpler. I mean, like I said, that we, we've tackled this before just by using consumer panels. That's what I thought you could have said. So, um, you know, it's, it's as well as asking people whether they've been exposed to something, it's, it's not just taking what they then tell you in the, in the study, because sometimes there can be inaccuracies in that. We can run models to see whether it's likely that they're exposed to those touch points. It's likely that it shifted brand perceptions. I haven't really seen it in terms of the ROI to, to sales, but it tends to do a good job for brand perceptions, but also as well, the sales impact of the sponsorship can sometimes be not a direct consumer impact. So for example, um, I remember doing a study for an alcohol brand who did football sponsorship, and the amount of money they made from licensing and selling beer at the, at the thing made it, made it worthwhile, and also that they had that position and a competitor didn't, right? Like, so this can be, sometimes MMM isn't the right approach to, to get to an answer. Um, and it, it's, it's not a perfect way, but it can be, uh, it's quite scalable. I imagine with the amount of sponsorship you guys do, it could get to some good learning. I but think. it comes back to, you know, what are you trying to measure? What are you trying mm. to achieve? And what is the right approach? Yeah. You know, we will, most of us will all try and say, what is the fastest approach? You know, going back to traditional methods sometimes actually can garner up much richer insights at the same time. Mm. For me, like we do a lot in this space, obviously, and it's the biggest bugbear if we don't control for it perfectly in the MMM for sure. Um, but it comes back to that defining success. It's think about all the goals that it might be be generating. With us, it's a bit unique. You know, our sponsorship mm. often is our product. You know, so you've, you've got to be there to, to buy credibility, but then you need to measure that. What's the influence on that? There's then a part of it that drives brand funnel KPIs and you can measure that effect through to sales. Uh, there's the fact that then at the events people might be buying your products or whatever you're sponsoring. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's drawing out all the things that you think might be an outcome of it and trying to piece it all together and it, it, hopefully you, you, know, you will see it ladders up. Mm. But be realistic, there's not going to be, for something like that, there's not going to be one way of measuring it. Mm. Yeah. Great. Great stuff. Okay, well, I hope the answer was good. So, thank you very much, everyone. And that's the end of this panel. Thank you very much for all our specialists. Good job. Good job. <laughs> <laughs>